You're listening to Navigating the French on Paris Underground Radio. Hello, and welcome to Navigating the French, the podcast where each episode we look at a French word and try and see what it tells us about French culture. I'm your host, Emily Monaco. Today, I'm chatting with Keith Van Sickle, an author and American expat living in Provence for over a decade. He's here to discuss a French tradition that kind of sounds like arguing, but is actually a staple of the French intellectual mindset, something that's rooted in 17th and 18th century salon, where salonnières would moderate boisterous discussions of everything and anything under the sun. Débat. Welcome, Keith. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Keith, can you tell me a little bit about sort of what brought you to France and what you do uh, in France? Yes, well, certainly. Uh, thank you for having me on the program. And my French adventure surprisingly started in Switzerland about 25 years ago. My wife and I were on an expat assignment in Neuchâtel, which is a small canton in the West. And we uh, worked there and traveled all over Europe, and it really just changed our lives. It was so different. It was so exciting that when it was over, after five years, and we moved back to the United States, we wanted to have another expat assignment. And we looked for one, but they're hard to find. We were lucky to have just one. And so in 2008, we decided to become part-time expats. And so we created our own expat gig. We became consultants so that we could travel more and have more flexibility. And we started living in Provence. And in Switzerland, we had worked in English, so we'd never really had to learn the language and really didn't, and therefore couldn't really understand Swiss society at a very deep level. We couldn't read the paper, or watch TV, and all of our friends there were people who spoke English. And in France, we decided to do it differently. We decided to learn the language, which we did in our 50s, which was incredibly hard, but immensely satisfying. And we decided to only create a social circle with native French speakers. And so since 2008, we've lived part of the year in France with some small gaps like under COVID and have really come to love that country and to try to understand it. And surprisingly, I've also uh, along the way become a writer, uh, which I, I never was. I had a career in finance and technology. And so I've written three books about France, uh, two about our life in France, and a third, which is about to come out, which is a guide to Provence, sort of an insider's guide to Provence. And I also write for a number of publications focused on France, like France Today and My French Life and Perfectly Provence. So that, that first expat assignment 25 years ago really changed our lives. It sounds like it, and um, and I'll definitely include links to those um, those books for folks who want to check them out in the description of the podcast. Now, you we you and I have been living or spending time in France for about the same amount of time for over a decade now, and I think one of the things that is pretty striking to Americans uh, or to you know foreigners who spend time in France is this fact that French people really do like to argue with each other. They can be pretty contentious. <laughs> and that's sort of the root of the word that we're going to be discussing today, débat. And one of my favorite things that I ever heard about, you know, sort of the French approach to arguing was said in reference to the fact that we have so many contests for things, uh, different concours, and they always, and this person said to me, oh, well, the French don't like to decide what they like. They like other peoples to tell them what they should like so that they can disagree with them. Does that feel right to you? Do you think that the French are just natural contrarians? They just like being anti side of things? I think, uh, well, first of all, the French are famously râleur. They like mm -hmm. to complain about things. I do think that's part of the French character, and they're known as being the most pessimistic people in Europe, if you look at any sort of poll. So to some extent, yes, but I think more than that, the French enjoy intellectual debat, the, the discussion. Not, not necessarily, I think, of as an argument. Uh, arguments are often contentious and negative and Somebody's trying to win. Uh, for example, the you know debate in English, you're trying to win. Whereas debat, it's more of a mutual 
exploration of things. The French really enjoy exploring ideas and understanding someone else's point of view, even if they don't agree with it. So I think that that is, is more a part of the richness of French intellectual life, uh, part of their love of ideas, love of philosophers, love of literature, and just the fun of um, batting ideas around, whether they agree or not, it's fun to explore and understand the differences. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think it's really telling that in the French public high school system, all French or any French uh, senior who's going to university takes philosophy as their uh, elective instead of taking, you know, French, which would be English, you know, the literature class. As a senior, they take philosophy instead. So they're learning not only sort of how to think critically and how to cultivate this idea of the esprit critique, the critical sort of mindset, but they're learning about all of these philosophers like Descartes um, and Rousseau who kind of built French, the French way of thinking as we, as we see it today. Do you feel like, you know, you said that you cultivated a social circle of people who were mostly native French speakers. Do you feel like, you know, it, it would be natural in the course of a normal conversation with one of your friends to have a reference to philosophy or philo philosophical ways of thinking? Uh, absolutely. And it's interesting that you mentioned the, the French educational system because I think that informs a lot of how French people approach this. So not only do they take philosophy as seniors as part of the, the baccalaureate, you know, the baccalaureate exam, but Throughout uh, the French education system from uh, middle school on, you don't have, I mean, there's no real traditional multiple choice tests in France, but rather here's something to read and write a, a one or two or three page essay answer. And so the French from early in their education are trained to present a coherent narrative to explain why they believe this, whether it's a a course on history or geography or anything else. So they have a, a logical, rational approach to things. And when you get to the philosophy courses and you have to answer the, the important questions, it's the you know, tes, antithese, synthese approach where you have evidence on one side, countervailing evidence, you bring it all together in your conclusion. And this goes back to the, the great critical thinkers like Descartes where you think very logically, and that same approach shows up in how they debate, how they how they discuss things. It's very much this, as you mentioned, l'esprit critique, the idea that you should not take things at face value. You should think them through yourself, draw your own conclusions, don't be gullible, and really have your own point of view. Now, what's interesting, I think, is that some of that esprit critique has been damaged and set back over the last 20 years or so with the rise of the internet. Because with that, you know, we all have all this information coming to us, uh, a lot of misinformation coming to us. There's less time to reflect. And a lot of information on the internet is presented to us by algorithms which are designed to provoke and to inflame. And one of the things this results in is we, we live more in information silos where we tend to receive information that reinforces our beliefs and our biases, and we get less of that important contradictory evidence, which is essential for critical thinking. So yes, that exists, but it is, I think, under assault. And I mean, I think that's true. That seems to be a widespread problem, but specifically in France and, and you know, in reference to what you said, this sort of Thèse, antithèse, synthèse way of thinking, which is how French people learn to write essays, as opposed to like the introduction, three paragraphs and conclusion, <laughs> they learn to write thesis, antithesis, synthesis. And it does mean that sometimes you get this sense, especially coming from somewhere that isn't France, that the French are, you know, being deliberately contrarian or playing devil's advocate, but I often feel like they're, you know, when when you actually sit with it for a while, sometimes people are arguing the opposite of what they actually believe just mm -hmm, to sort of mm -hmm, take mm -hmm. that argument yes. as far as it'll go. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Now, nowhere is this um, more contentious for someone raised in the U.S. than at the dinner table because, you know, I got told <laughs> that it's not dinner table conversation so many times when I was a kid. And in France, it seems like not only do dinner table conversations or discussions get really heated, there are it, it almost seems as though there aren't any subjects that are off the table. Like people are very willing to talk about politics. People are really willing to talk about um, current events. Are there any topics that, in your experience, are kind of off the table in a French dinner table conversation? Yes, certainly money is off the table if it involves personal finances. People don't talk about their own personal financial situations or inquire about those of others. That's uh, I've seen that as an absolutely forbidden pop topic. Perhaps in some places it isn't, but that's that's clearly off the table. Though though uh, conversely. It's not that money specifically is off the table. Uh, the French love to complain about how much things cost. The, the power, the purchasing power has gone down. So, so complaining about costs is one thing, but talking about your own is something else. I, I, I've actually had this conversation with French people, and uh, they've told me that traditionally there were sort of the big three that you didn't talk about if you didn't know already where other people were coming from. Because you could go off the rails, and those were religious, religion, politics, and the military. Surprisingly, oh, that is surprising. Particularly national service, you know, the, the not the draft, but like that. That was for for some years an incredibly contentious subject. Less so today. I think you can discuss po politics and religion, but if you don't know where somebody else is coming from, you have to be very careful because it can become too contentious. Uh, Today, I would I would say there are two more subjects that you have to be very careful about if you don't know where people come from. One is immigration, because that's such a hot topic, and the other is vaccines. Just uh -huh. as in the states, you have pro anti vaxxers who just can't talk to each other, and 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 I think these are subjects which which often lead to polemics, not discussion, not logical argument. And it reminds me that I, I was talking to one French friend and said, so boy, you, you folks in France, you can talk about anything with anybody. They said, yes, yes, anything. I said, really, how about do you discuss things with hardcore uh, followers of the Front National, which is now the Rassemblement National, the far right French political party? And she said, oh, no, 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 I, I never talked to, to them. Well, why? Well, because it's just not interesting. It's not worth the time. You just get polemics. You don't did it, get a discussion. And that, that, I'm sure, is not to say that everyone who votes FN is like that at all. Like any group, there's a, there's a range. But for the really hardcore at the extreme, that's off the table. We don't talk to them. So that was, that was interesting. That probably also is true of someone on the far left of the political extreme in France. But I've tended to hear it more about the far right. Yeah. Well, I have heard uh, someone say the Communist Party in France is so small it could fit in a phone booth. So maybe it's just less of a, maybe it's just the same is true, but it comes up less. I think that's right. That's really interesting. And I think also uh, interesting, I'm, I'm repeating myself a million times, but the fact that your French friend said, in, said it's not interesting to talk with people like that. I think that the French use the word interesting differently than we do. Like we're like, oh yeah, that's cool. That's interesting. They're like, it's not worth my time. Interesting. So I can see how it's it's not just, oh, I don't want to talk about that. It's that, well, they're not going to defend their arguments with facts and therefore mm -hmm. it won't be as fun to debate them. Exactly. Exactly. I think a big part of debat is trying to understand the other person's point of view and their reasoning behind it. So if they if they don't have one, then what's the point? And and it's also that's why when you have that sort of dinner gathering or lunch gathering, it's important to have an opinion. It's important to be interesting. Not, you know, I don't I don't necessarily care what your opinion is, but I want you to have one. Mm -hmm. And I want you to be able to defend it intelligently. And that's part of the fun. If you if you either sit there like a lump of clay or you have an opinion, but it's just because you feel that way. Well, that's no fun at all. That's you're not playing the game. Yeah. And that's actually a really essential part that I think some people miss out on is that if you're a dinner guest in France, 
and you just sort of sit there demurely and you don't ha- and you decide to opt out of the opinionated conversation, you're being a bad guest. Mm-hmm. Like that's it's the almost the opposite of what I was raised, which is, you know, oh, if you don't have anything nice to say, just sort of sit there and don't say anything. No, in France, if you get invited over to a dinner party and someone says something and, and you know, you believe the opposite, say it. That makes you a good guest. <laughs> they want to debate you. If you're enjoying this episode of Navigating the French, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, Paris Undressed, delving into the world of lingerie in the city of love. Navigating the French will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now back to Navigating the French. Are there any other sort of faux pas or or wrong ways to debate? Like, um, you know, can you talk over someone or can you interrupt someone or anything like that that people might not be aware of etiquette wise when it comes to débat in France? Well, I think the hotter things get, the more people tend to, to, to talk over each other. And and I, I've certainly been in dinner parties where four people are talking at once and nobody's listening to each other. <laughs> so that does happen. Uh, I, I think uh, other than, you know, you really need to have an opinion. Uh, I think the 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 real faux pas is to get personal, you know, for it to be a personal attack. So so there's one thing to say, I disagree with your ideas, or even I think those are stupid ideas. You tend not to say that, but I disagree. But to say you're stupid or you're wrong or you're bad is verboten. You know, you don't attack someone's someone individually, you attack their ideas, and that's okay. And I and I think that's why the French tend not to take disagreements personally because they're not personal attacks. You know, they they have this impressive ability to disagree without being disagreeable. And in the States, it often devolves into personal attacks or, gee, if somebody believes that, they must be a bad person. And therefore, it can quickly become personal and damage relationships. And I've seen within my own extended family where political disagreements cause two previously close relatives to stop having Thanksgiving dinner together because, you know, they they something's wrong with them as opposed to just, I don't agree with their opinions. And that's a different thing. Um, whereas, whereas the French can discuss very hot subjects and not let it become personal. And I, I had that experience myself. Uh, when I, when I really experienced for the first time was about five years ago, uh, you may recall Edward Snowden, the former uh, NSA contractor who revealed lots of U.S. government secrets about government spying on U.S. citizens, on foreign citizens, etc. And there was a period where every few weeks there was a new revelation and an uproar uh, because, you know, for example, the U.S. was tapping French Chancellor Angela Merkel's personal phone. Big problem with Germany. Well. That week, it happened to be that Snowden revealed that the U.S. had been spying on France. And I don't know if you remember it, but it was a huge story in France. Every day, front page news, top of the news at at 8 o'clock, people were angry about this. And that week, we happened to be hosting two couples, uh, two French couples for dinner. And it was a nice conversation. And then in the middle of it, the middle of dinner, my wife surprised me by asking brightly, so what does everybody think of Edward Snowden? (laughs) And as an American, because this was my government doing this, I thought she, you know, had thrown a a hand grenade into the dinner table. I was going to dive under and we were going to be attacked as Americans and representatives of this terrible government. And it was in fact a very hot conversation and uh, people had very strong opinions, and it was, but but it was not, by the way, what I would have guessed. It was not the French versus the Americans. It we sort of divided into two camps, which were each mixed, and everybody had a strong opinion, and we went on for about twenty thirty minutes, and then it was over. The subject was closed. We'd all had our say, and my wife said, "So is you know, is everybody ready for dessert?" And we moved on to the next course and we moved on to the next subject. And it was just this remarkable thing because in the middle of it, you really felt this is going to go badly wrong. And it was just really interesting. And uh, and that's really where I really had the visceral experience of being in the middle of it, but coming out the other side with no damage. 
Mm-hmm. It was great. And you put your finger on an, a really interesting aspect of this, which is that so much of it does tend to happen around the dinner table. And the way that the French meal is constructed, I mean, the way that it was protected in 2010 by, you know, on the list of intangible world heritage with UNESCO is this division into courses. So it seems almost surreal when you see, you know, people debating each other, arguing with each other over the appetizer. And then all of a sudden the appetizer's finished. And now these days, you know, the smokers get up and they all go outside to smoke. And by the time everybody sits back down for the main, we're moving on to a new topic of conversation. And it's almost as though the people who were red in the face yelling at each other, like it's, it's, it's just over, it's just done. And they, and they're all still friends. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal, but it can be very surprising to watch at first for sure. Mm -hmm. I think another uh, way in which the French educational system informs this or affects this is because the French grow up being used, they're, they're used to being contradicted and not taking it personally. They're used to being told they're wrong, actually. Mm-hmm. And they just get a thick skin because, you know, the the French educational system is very strong on criticism and pretty vanishingly light on praise. And so the teachers are always telling you wrong and you just get used to that and it doesn't bother you. Whereas American, the American system is, is built on praise and everything's wonderful and you're great. And so I think we Americans have a harder time being contradicted than the French was just like, oh yeah, well, that's just the way things are. No problem. So you're, you're taught to be criticized and you're taught to defend your point of view. No, absolutely. I, um, I went, to, I did a semester of my ninth grade year here in France and I was sitting, I remember, I will never forget the feeling. I was sitting in my biology class and we had taken a pop quiz and the teacher standing at the front of the room, reading off everybody's grades and adding color commentary. So it's like, oh, you know, uh, Tongi, uh, six out of 20, you really didn't study, did you? You know, <laughs> Marie, 15 out of 20. Bon, it's all right, but you could have done better. I don't know what you, you weren't paying attention this day. You must have been tired. And I was like, what is happening? You know, you're used to getting your test put face down on your desk and everybody keeps their grades private. You know, in France, it's very much, you know, people are, people are, uh, very accustomed to public, uh, criticism. You're absolutely right. Well, the, the, the flip side, funny story, is that a friend of mine who grew up in France, who worked for some years in France and then came to the States, you know, not used to praise at all. So he got his first job in the States and completed his first assignment, whatever, his, whatever it was. And his job said, hey, great job. And for an American to be like, thanks, fine. It didn't mean anything. But he was so, that just doesn't happen in France for his boss to say, hey, great job. He thought, Oh my God, I, I just, I must be, have done a fantastic job. This must be the greatest thing ever. And he was really pumped up about it until he realized eh, it didn't really mean that much. Mm, <laughs> yeah. Well, we do tend to have a quite a bit of false praise. I mean, false, empty, empty praise in the States. You know, we're constantly mm-hmm. looking to say something positive. And I actually remember when I first moved here, I felt like, I was, um, you know, I was really into food and I was constantly picking restaurants for pe- for us to meet, you know, with friends and things. And at the end of the meal, I'd say, you know, okay, well, what did you all think? And they'd be like, oh, yeah, it was okay. It was fine. But, you know, the room is a little cold. The room is a little sad or the <laughs> server wasn't particularly, you know, smiley or something. And I was like, wow, they really don't like any of the places that I'm picking. And it's just that Americans, you know, even if you hate it, you're going to find the one positive thing you can say. And the French they're always sort of trying to needle out the the critical things. But it's I don't think it's necessarily... So you mentioned earlier in our conversation this word, chaleur. So chaleur, <laughs> R-A-L-E-U-R, is this you know word that's very difficult to translate. It's a very specific <laughs> kind of complaining. I actually wrote a whole article about it for the BBC. And in the context of that article, I interviewed Julie Barlow, who was our first guest on this podcast. She came on to talk about the word bonjour. And she sort of said that to Americans, when you say something negative, it sounds like you're closing the conversation. Whereas to French people, when you say something negative, it implies that you're inviting someone else's opinion. So Mm -hmm. finding something negative is like a good thing almost. Like it's very, it feels very backwards. Well, I think that Americans tend to avoid hot subjects, tend to look for areas of agreement rather than disagreement. Or where we disagree, we look for subjects which are harmless. You know, your football team versus my football team. Well, that doesn't really mean anything. And we can argue, but it's all in fun. Mm-hmm. 
but but really fundamental disagreements we we just look for where we can agree more than where we can disagree whereas i think the french are more inclined to look for differences because that's more interesting why mm-hmm. do, why do we disagree so I, I agree with that but negative tends to close the conversation we don't want to do that so let's let's avoid that and continue the conversation on a positive note where we can agree even if it's banal we can agree right i i, I also find that my my french friends tend to make fun of the especially when they see american tourists the word amazing because everything <laughs> is amazing the eiffel tower is amazing this dish was amazing the cafe was amazing so they, they tease me about that word yeah i've heard that too <laughs> Yeah, they tease about amazing, and then they also tend to criticize. And I will say, as a fellow American, I am a little embarrassed sometimes. They criticize not only our use of the word amazing, but the volume at which we speak. In the public transport, in the streets, you know, we're constantly loud. And it strikes me as something interesting that the French would be so open to debating, but so anti-loud voices. Do you have any sort of instinctual thought about why the French are so anti-volume? You know, I think they're just natural, national characteristics. Americans are loud. Australians are loud. They tend to be boisterous also. If you see groups of Australians, the Brits and French tend to be a little quieter. Though, Though I would say for a relatively quiet country, they sure have no problem making noise with their tradition of street protests, manifestations. <laughs> you know, those are the loudest, most boisterous things you ever saw. Look at mu- look at the months and months and months of gilets jaunes, yellow vest protests. I mean, that is a that is a French art form that they excel at, and those are not quiet affairs. So, so, so maybe it's not that they're quiet so much as they just have different means of express expressing their loudness. And they do it in bursts rather than more regularly like Americans do. Now, Deba obviously has this English cognate debate. But I think as we've sort of discovered over the past half hour of speaking to, to each other, these two things don't really necessarily mean the exact same thing. But if you had to distill it down to sort of one nucleus, what do you think the major differences between Deba and debate really are? Well, first, it's interesting. Debat has two translations into English. One is debate and one is discussion. So the French have debates, just as the Americans have debates. You know, we have presidential debates, both of us. We have political debates, both of us, where you're trying to win. Whereas debat discussion is really more a search, an exploration of a subject, an intellectual exploration. So, so. I would say debate is contentious, aggressive, trying to win, whereas debat, discussion, that side is more an exploration, not necessarily a competition. If you're enjoying this episode of Navigating the French, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, The Heart of You, where expert Annette talks manifesting, tarot, and so much more. Navigating the French will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now back to Navigating the French. Keith, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. It has been illuminating. Um, I have one last question for you before we uh, part ways. And that is, what is your favorite word in French? Hmm. Uh, Well, there's one word that I've always loved the sound of, though it's not a common word, so I don't use it very often. And that is cancaillerie, hardware store. <laughs> you know, there aren't that many hardware stores anymore. Mr. Bricolage, the big chain, has wiped out a lot of them. So you don't see them very much. But we used to have one in Neuchâtel where we lived in Switzerland. And I just I just love the sound of the word, cancaillerie. It's lovely. I love that word too. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, for joining me today, and I'll be sure and share links to your books in the description for anybody who wants to read more from Keith. Keith, are you on social media anywhere, Twitter, Instagram, where people can follow you? Uh, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, and my own website, which is where I collect all the articles I write and other information about France is keithvansickle.com. Amazing. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, you too. Bye-bye.
This has been Navigating the French. You can find more from me, Emily Monaco, at Emily underscore in underscore France on Twitter and Instagram. This podcast is produced by Paris Underground Radio. To listen to other episodes of this podcast or to discover more podcasts like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com. Thanks for listening and à bientôt. This episode of Navigating the French was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.